All right, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm Ed Jastrom. I'm a certified financial planner and I'm the director of financial planning here at Heritage Financial. Joining me today is Eric Stutman. Eric is the owner and a consultant at Top Choice College Consulting. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about how parents and students can navigate the college application and admission process and try to do so in a stress-free way. So, Eric, thanks for joining me. Thanks for inviting me, Ed. Glad to be here. Excellent. Uh, before we dive into our dialogue a little bit, could you just give our audience a little background about yourself and how you started Top Choice and why you do the work that you do? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm originally from Long Island, New York, and uh, attended University of Virginia for electrical engineering. And then when I moved to Boston, I attended BU for uh, biomedical engineering. And I really had a, a good career in high tech. Uh, but then I was looking for something different. And um, I was really enjoying the college process with my daughter when everyone else I was talking with was saying how stressful and sort of, you know, unpleasant it was. So uh, I really thought about switching careers where I could really be my own boss and really help people in a very direct way instead of engineering, which is a more indirect. So I started helping friends and family. And then in 2016, I attended a, a program for new independent educational consultants. That's sort of what we're called, uh, you know, more colloquially uh, college consultant. And so I opened Top Choice College Consulting in, you know, shortly thereafter in 2016. Excellent. Well, yeah. let's start a little bit with kind of a high level perspective then. So the whole process, I think we know can be stressful, you know, as you alluded to what you were observing while you were going kind of through it back then. I know your approach really tries to address that and reduce the stress around the process. So how are the ways that you, you try to do with that with the clients that you serve? Yeah, thanks. That's really one of my main thrusts and goals for my whole practice is to reduce the stress of college admissions. I want people to enjoy this exciting time and think of it more of an experience than to stress and think of it as like a drudge process. Okay. And the way I mainly do this is by educating them so they know what to expect, what's going to happen and when. So there's really very few surprises. I help them stay organized and on time. And those are other ways to reduce stress. You know, when you know that you're going to do a good job at the right time and you're not missing anything, you can really relax and enjoy the ride. The other thing I do is make sure right away that families know, hey, if your student wants to go to college, they're going to go. There's a college for every level of student in the United States. And I firmly believe from all the colleges we're going to put on their list, they can end up in the same office, you know, have the same career outcome from any of the colleges on their list. It's more about the student, the person, not the college that makes your career. So all I'm telling them what we're doing is finding great fits for their students so that their student will be happy and thrive and have a lot of really good options. That sounds like an approach that makes perfect sense. Thank you. You mentioned the, the timing aspect of things and how the timing of events can maybe add to the, the stress aspect of parents and students thinking about, do they get started at the right time? Do they get started early enough? Um, my son just turned two. My wife and I have started some college savings, but I hope we're a long way away before we're visiting any schools or helping edit any essays. But when is the right time to start? What's your recommendation for the, the timeline of the you know, process to begin looking at schools yeah. more seriously? That's a good question. Um, most families come to you know, meet me at any time after 10th grade is over. I do meet families earlier because basically whenever a family has stress and anxiety about how does this whole thing work, that's when I'm happy to meet with them to have the first meeting I call admissions 101 
where it's an hour or so of here's how the whole thing works and when everything is going to happen to reduce the overall stress level. So um, I really like to have, you know, to get started in earnest when 10th grade is over, we've got two out of the three years of academics complete. So we have a fairly complete academic profile. And um, I actually, you know, consider families kind of on the early side if they start before sort of mid midway through junior year. So if I can make a list for them based on the student's interests, anytime after sophomore year, then they've got the whole junior year to do their visits, to do their research, to shrink the list down. And even though the common application, which is where most students will be applying, uh, goes live in August 1st between their junior and senior years of high school, I started with them way back in January or February so that we can, again, in a low stress way, chip away at it over the winter and spring so it's not a rush. And then as this slide shows, we, gotta, we wanna finalize that list over the summer between junior and senior year so that they're ready for all of the fall deadlines uh, for the college applications. That makes sense? Excellent. That makes good sense. I, I like the way that you've plotted that out and someone working with you could really kind of go through that timeline. I know that you've talked about, you know, another way to try to reduce the stress in this process, in addition to having a schedule like this, is to really make sure that parents and students are looking at colleges that are a good fit. And not just a good fit, meaning you can afford it, but a good fit in a lot of ways. And you've talked to me about three dimensions of a good fit. Can you share with our audience what your perspective on those dimensions of a good fit for a school are? Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's look at the next slide with the three dimensions of fit. So it's really important to have a good college list. You know, sometimes families will come to me and they seem very focused on, let's say, taking the SAT. And I'm saying, well, if we don't have a good list, like you, you don't know where you're sending it to, right? And working hard on the applications and essays doesn't make sense until we have a really good list where we feel like you'll be happy at every college on the list. And I look at it in three different ways. It's gotta be an academic fit, right? And the academic fit, you understand that we, like it's always been, we wanna make sure you're applying to a variety of colleges where, you know, I'll call it a likely college if I think there's a very high chance of you being admitted because your grades are higher than the average student they admit, a target college if they admit students with very close to what your grades are, and a reach college for the colleges where, you know, your grades are lower than the average that they're accepting. Um, so it's really important to have that balance, right? We don't want to get denied at every college if they only apply to reaches. And I actually tell them, I don't want them to get admitted to every college, right? If they only apply to likely schools, then they really haven't tested the whole system. You know, where is my ceiling? Where, how competitive a college can I get admitted to? So we have a variety at all times. Um, and then these tools that I'm listing here, how do you figure out if a college is your academic fit? These days, there's these um, programs there called Naviance and SCORE. And they're listed there as the websites. And what they are, you know, um, is very interesting. Your high school will subscribe to these websites. And the high school is keeping track of, okay, Johnny, you applied to the following 10 colleges. We know that because you had us send your transcript and recommendations to those 10. So that clued us into where you're applying to. And we know your grades because we're your high school. So they're keeping this data and then they're begging Johnny to let them know where did you get admitted to? Where did you get denied? Where did you get waitlisted or any of the results? And then through these programs, whichever one the high school subscribes to, Families, uh, students, and parents can look at the data from their own high school and see how have students, you know, have students with my grades 
been getting into the colleges I'm looking at. And it's another way to know, in addition to, let's say, just the acceptance rate of a college, is it a likely target or reach for me? And, you know, we can read colleges' websites. They'll tell you, oh, the average GPA of someone admitted. But you don't know about your high school because your high school might have GPAs from zero to six or zero to 100. So the beauty of the Naviance and the score is we have data from my high school, apples to apples comparison, to see what's the admit rate at my high school at these colleges. So very, very helpful. Okay. The guidance council will help look at academic fit. That's really the one piece that they can help with. And, you know, people always enjoy looking at rankings, which I just, you know, tell them to look at with a grain of salt because it's not everything. Ranking doesn't tell you everything about a college. Okay. So that's sort of the academic fit. Um, on the social side, I think it's just as important. You know, you have to feel like you belong there and you like the student body. A college might have a program that sounds interesting to you, but if it's the student body, let's say is politically opposed to what you like, you know, or is very focused on fraternities and sororities, which you're not into, it wouldn't be a good fit. So I ask them a lot of questions and I have something called Corsava, which is listed here. And that asks them 138 questions about college and they put it into the, I must have it, I'd like to have it, I don't care or I don't want it. And it develops this profile so that the family and I can look for colleges that are kind of matching as best as possible your interests and likes, okay? I list some other websites here where students write in, hey, what's the typical student like? What are the stereotypes like? So instead of having to necessarily visit in person to get the sense of the culture of a college, you wanna read what all the students and faculty are saying about it to give you a sense of, you know, what's the culture and does it sound like a place I'd enjoy? And then of course, now it says, the last thing it says there is virtual tours. These of course have gotten a lot better since COVID hit. <clears throat> they used to be pretty rare, but now everybody has virtual tours uh, that try to give you, you know, a sense of the college before you get in your car or an airplane. But, you know, they're limited because sometimes you really have to drive up and see what you're getting. You can't see everything from a computer screen, okay? Finally, um, the college has to fit the family's financial you know, goals and budget. So those are the three aspects to help us find like which colleges are gonna be a good fit for me. I guess I also wanna say um, in terms of the rankings, I made my own rankings, which are on my website for free if anyone wants to see them, topchoicecollegeconsulting.com because I like looking for colleges that have good students, right? So for my clients, I want colleges with good students, happy students, which means they stay for a sophomore year and they graduate. Colleges that have good financial aid, right? So, so far Harvard's doing very well, but then I'm looking for colleges with higher than expected acceptance rates so that more of my students can go to such a great place. And that's where Harvard kind of sinks in my rankings because their acceptance rate is so low. So like, where are these hidden gems, good quality students and they like it there, but the acceptance rate is higher than expected. So that's a fun ranking system for people to check out. That would be good to visit for our audience after the presentation. Just thinking about these dimensions, a lot of these tools weren't available when you or I were applying to colleges. You know, it's been 20 years since I graduated and probably for our clients and audience who have students who are in high school or approaching that timeline, it's probably been closer to 30 years that they've been out of college. So what's changed the most about this whole process from, you know, the time that, that I was in school or, or the time that you know, some of our clients were in school themselves. What are the biggest changes that parents should really be 
prepared for to think about differently from when their experience was taking place? Yeah, well, good question. Quite a bit has changed. Um, you know, one thing that comes to mind is the common application. So the website's been around for a while, but it wasn't as universally used as it is now. So this is a website where a student can log in and make their profile and apply to over a thousand colleges in the United States. Now you can only apply to 20, but what I mean is there are a thousand in there that are available uh, for students to apply to. So the, the reason it's called the common app is you type in all of your sort of demographic information only once instead of having to fill it out over and over for each college. Then each college has a section where they can ask you questions just for them. But it definitely makes it a whole lot easier to apply. So therefore, I think students are applying to more colleges than ever because it's easier than ever, okay? Another reason colleges are getting more applications than in your day and my day is, you know, people don't view the distance as a big barrier anymore. So if a student from Massachusetts wants to consider Stanford, not, you know, just the fact that they have to fly there doesn't really stop them anymore. Whereas, you know, Stanford and MIT used to get much more local applications. So, and this also includes the rest of the world. So now they're getting applications from further in the United States and all over the world. So that's also contributing to colleges getting more applications for the same number of spots, which means it looks like the acceptance rate keeps going down over time. So those are big changes. Another thing I want people to think about is reputations have changed over the years, right? Locally, places like Northeastern and BU, when I applied, admitted most of the students, 70, 80%. Now they become popular because Boston's a great college, a great college town. And Northeastern has the co-op program that families love, help students find jobs. Now their acceptance rates are down in the 15% range, super competitive. So families need to realize that um, for some colleges, reputations and competitiveness have, have changed significantly. Um, what else? I mentioned the Naviance and score. So that's a big change. Never before could you look at your high school and see, hmm, Harvard seems to like our high school because they're admitting it at 15% rate when the whole world is being admitted at a 4% rate, things like that. So those are very powerful tools that we never had before. Exactly. Um, in terms of quantification, colleges on their end are also now using very powerful software tools to do things they call like class shaping, and enrollment management, where they, they're gathering data about every student. They just get your zip code and they know a lot about you and your family and the average income, right? So they look at your application and the software knows a whole lot about you, or at least it assumes a whole lot about students. And it helps them make decisions in terms of like, who do we have to admit in order to have a broad range of students here? What kind of maybe scholarship do we need to offer? in order to secure that student, to get them to say yes. So they have, you know, people who their whole job is to run these software packages to help the colleges gather data and make decisions based on hundreds of data points that they never had in the past. So that's fascinating, I think. And then I will say, you know, recently COVID, I said um, sort of improved all the virtual tours. So that's mm -hmm. kind of nice. Families get a better tour from their home as, than they used to. Um, and then there's a big thing where now SAT scores and ACT scores are mainly test optional, again, because COVID made it impossible for at least a year for students to submit. So everybody went test optional. Um, so that's a, that's a topic we could talk about for an hour, but so we won't. But the last thing I wanted to mention, which has been in the newspaper recently, is Another thing that's changed over the years is legacy admissions is becoming sort of de-emphasized. Colleges mm -hmm. are claiming that it's not fair that just because your mom or dad went to our college, we should give you a better chance than someone else who, you know, whose family didn't. 
So some colleges, including MIT and now I think Amherst College, are saying it doesn't matter where your parents went. We're just looking at you and you alone. So lots of changes since 20 and 30 years ago. I think that makes sense based on you know, some of the feedback that we hear from clients who have gone through this process since, you know, I've been working in this industry, it, it does seem to echo the changes that you mentioned that, you know, the test scores being optional, um, the extent that people are willing to travel or explore schools outside of their, you know, typical comfort zone, I've definitely been seeing that uh, over the years. Mm-hmm. But uh, switching gears, maybe just, just a little bit, talking on the you know, fin- financial side, the funding side of mm-hmm. things now. For parents and students today, what should a reasonable expectation be or some range of expectations be for the cost of getting an undergraduate degree right now? So this, this uh, is from Mass Bay Community College nearby. They're showing how, hooray, we're, we're an inexpensive way to get a two-year college degree. So you can see for community college, if you're living at home, it can be as low as $7,000 a year. Now, um, when students, let's say the next one there is Framingham State. So that's a state school, Massachusetts state school for in-state students. You see the 11,000, but I wanna remind families they have to add probably 13 to 15,000 to that number to get the, the full tuition because that doesn't show room and board. Okay, so that 11 is really 25,000 a year for a Framingham State education. So that now we're at 100,000 for all four years. Um, when we go to like a UMass Amherst, we're at about 32,000 a year. And then um, they don't show it here, but the next more expensive category is out of state universities. So UNH, UVM, Michigan, and the likes, those will range from about 40 to 65,000 a year, like a Michigan being on the high end. And then you got your private universities, which they're showing mainly, I guess, in the red color here, um, ranging from, you know, all in tuition room and board, sort of 50,000 to over 80,000. Over 80,000 per year, uh, for a private college education. Big number. So some affordable options, but certainly it won't be cheap for many. Um, that's something that maybe hasn't changed in the last 20 years since I've been mm-hmm. in school, uh, for certain. But that makes me think of, you know, some of the conversations that we do have with clients about, you know, these topics and, um, you know, a lot of the, the parents that we talk to do have saving for college and funding college as one of their financial goals. And they're thinking about how much they want to save and how much um, they maybe want their student, their child to have this concept of um, skin in the game, right? So even for families who could afford to pay 100% of tuition and room board and fees themselves, they might want to have the student on the hook, so to speak, for a little bit themselves. What's your perspective on that skin in the game idea? There's no right answer, but could you share maybe some thoughts from your experiences on that? Yeah, of course. I mean, of course, there's no right answer. Um, This is definitely something that is a family to family discussion, decision. You know, um, it really helps me out when the families, at least as early as possible in the process, determine sort of what's their budget and what's their comfort level, you know? And there's Mm -hmm. also online tools I point them to where they can determine, you know, would we qualify for any financial aid from either the government or the institution? So. A lot of times families just sort of wave their hands and say, oh, I think we're okay. Um, But it's much better if they work with people like you and tell me sort of what is the real number that they're willing to spend so that we don't waste our time looking at and applying to colleges that we're not interested in the sticker price. 
you know, because that's that's a real waste of time. Um, in terms of one way that anyone can get a little skin in the game, when students apply for financial aid, and even Bill Gates and Elon Musk's children could apply for financial aid, and the U.S. government will give them the five thousand dollar a year low interest student loan. And that way they can have, you know, $5,000 per year in the game, maybe develop a little credit. And, um, you know, so that has nothing to do with the family's income. Every student is entitled to get that loan if they want. So even a family that goes through the financial aid application process and has a expected family contribution that's much higher than the, the cost of attendance even those families that have high income and high assets, they could still get a, a modest loan for the student of about $5,000 so that a student, if they wanted, could have that skin in the game, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone, any student can get that. I think a lot of times parents yeah. forget that it's the student applying for financial aid. They feel, they feel like they are because right. they're trying to get help for the cost of college, but it's the student. And if you have triplets, uh, they each fill out a form because they're each applying for financial aid. In addition to a student being able to get that, that skin in the game, if a family was able to pay full price but wanted the student to have something, what are some of the other ways that if there was a family that couldn't pay full price or was trying to make sure that they got the most value out of the college costs and college experience, what are some of the other ways that families nowadays are finding that they're not paying the full sticker price? Yeah. Well, you see the sticker price, which I'm showing on that slide, and you know nobody wants to pay it. And uh, actually, overall, most people don't. So as a consultant, college admissions, I explain how the whole system works but I don't tell families like where or how to put their money. Again, that's something I want them to talk to you about. But right. there are two ways that most families actually don't pay the full sticker price. Now, one is called a merit scholarship, which is really just a discount, but they call it a merit scholarship because it makes students feel good about themselves and we'll take it. And what this is, is a college that's maybe the likely one on your list because your grades are better than the average one they're admitting. Gee, University of, let's say, Vermont says, how can we attract Ed? He's a top 10% student at his high school. So yes, we're going to admit him, but how can we attract him? Well, we'll offer him what's called a merit scholarship. It's a discount off of our tuition. And we'll tell him right up front, all four years, you can take, let's say, $20,000 off the sticker price. Please come to UVM instead of wherever else you were considering going. So this is a really great for all families. It has nothing to do with your bank account. They're merely looking at the students' grades and qualities and deciding, do we feel like we need to sweeten the pot in order to entice them to attend our university? <laughs> okay, and you can imagine as you get higher and higher up the competitive chain, Harvard is not offering anybody a merit scholarship. They have all the best students. They don't need to attract anybody. So it's the green likely colleges on students list that are trying to attract better students to raise their reputations, to raise their rankings. Okay, and typically there's no additional applications to fill out. You just fill out the regular ask. And if the college wants you badly, they'll make you a discount off. The other way that families don't pay the full price of college is when they really do need help based on the finances. So they can fill out these forms called the free application for federal student aid. It looks at income and savings of both the student and the family. And as you mentioned, this thing called an EFC, it comes out with an expected family contribution, how much the government thinks your family can afford per year for college. It just cranks it through a calculator, which you can get online tonight or now. And basically, if that number is above the cost of college, you're probably not getting any help. But if the number is below the full price of college, the universities will attempt 
They will ask you to pay that number that the government calculated, but they'll attempt not to make you pay much more than that. So for some families, the expected contribution is $5,000 and Harvard will pay all the rest from 5,000 up to 80, whatever it is. And for other families, the, the EFC is 60,000. So Harvard will try to pay the last 20,000, right? So this is how most of America doesn't pay the full price for college. Any questions on that? Any questions on that? So, for students who have good academic achievement, regardless of the, their financial condition, their family's financial condition, there might be opportunities to get a merit scholarship that's based on a school trying to attract that student to them because they have a good academic background. Separate and distinct from that merit scholarship, there's opportunities for aid where completing the, the FAFSA, looking at what might be available to you, and then the school and the federal government possibly providing some resources for you based on your financial need. And then regardless of financial need, there's always that uh, unsubsidized loan that we mentioned earlier for the, the first academic year starts at $5,000. So there, there should be something for everyone one way or another, in addition to clients who are saving and accumulating wealth for the purpose of putting it towards the college tuition. Is that yeah. Yeah. summarize the yeah, you did a a, job. A simplified yeah. high level from That's someone it. who hopefully has, a, like I said, a lot of years before I have to dig deep in, <laughs> into yeah. this stuff myself. But I'm glad you're saving already. Uh, me too. But uh, thinking about those big costs that we're seeing on this list. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we've we've mentioned a few resources. You, you know, you had a number of websites on the slide earlier about those dimensions of fit to look at the the schools that fit academically, the schools that fit socially. What are the top resources that the a family could use on the financial side to help with those uh, last bits of the conversation that we just had about? Yeah finding out the full price versus what they might be able to afford and what what okay. loans they may or may not get. What resources do they have for that? Yeah, I think the best two, uh, as best we two. can see on this slide, the, the bottom two things there, the EFC calculator. So instead of waiting for the fall and filling out the real government form to see, do I qualify for any need-based help? Anybody can Google EFC calculator and fill it out now and see approximately what their expected contribution is um, to really get a sense of, would we get any help at UMass, at Harvard, somewhere in between? So that's valuable. And then in a similar fashion, what it says below there, net price calculator. Every college in America is required by law to have this on their website. So for any, you pick a college and you say like Tufts University, net price calculator. University of Vermont, net price calculator. Anybody Googling that will get to another online calculator where you put in a lot of the same information about your savings, your income, and the student's grades. And they're gonna try to spit out, if your student's admitted, this is pretty much the bill we would send. And some colleges using the grades will even estimate the merit scholarship. So the University of Vermont does a really nice job. You put in their, their sort of GPA and you could put in SAT score if you wanted to and they show you, we're probably gonna give you a $15,000 a year merit scholarship, continue, fill out all the financial you know, information and then we'll give you the full picture, see if you qualify for the need-based aid. But again, why not everybody should get this preview of the cost of each college before we spend hours writing essays, applying, and then crossing our fingers for two months that they're going to say yes. So th those are the best things to do at any time. No matter what age your student is, it's kind of interesting to, to run those calculators. And Eric, if someone wanted to go on the EFC calculator mm -hmm. and just get a 
at a ballpark starting yeah. point. Yeah. About how long do you think it would take someone to put in the figures into the calculator and get a result if they were doing it just as a starting point? Yeah, five or 10 minutes, really quick. And I, you remind me though, Easy. in the net price calculator that I mentioned, some colleges have a like six question net price calculator. It's clearly not going to give you as accurate as the colleges that have net price calculators with more questions. So it might be a bit of a pain for you, but you want the ones that have the most questions because it'll give you the most accurate estimate. But uh, we do have a few um, Q and A's to take a look at. Uh, and then a, a couple other things that I thought of while, while we were talking. Okay. The, the first question was just uh, if a link to this will be available later. And yes, this will be um, recorded and uh, a replay link will be sent to anyone who's been participating. And it will also eventually be um, posted on our website, on Heritage Financial's website. So if there's mentions of um, some of these websites, some of these figures and tools and other things that Eric and I talked about, a replay would be available. The Another question, Eric, is really um, directed specifically for you if, if you find that this is a, the right venue to share. And the question relates to, for someone who engaged um, you for more specific services to really drill deep mm -hmm. into finding the right fit um, for a family and a student, how are your services priced and what would the relationship be like with you as a professional? And I'll let you decide how, how deep or, yeah. or not to get into that based on, yeah. you know, the variety of services that you do. Okay. Um, I'll just say in general, independent educational consultants like me um, charge either by the hour or they have these package prices. <laughs> And I find when I help families write from admissions 101 through all the essays and applications, the average student, it's about 20 hours of my time. So, you know, whether they're doing a package that's 20, you know, captures 20 hours of my time or paying by the hour for 20 hours, that's pretty much what the average person, you know, will, will need if they're doing, you know, getting my help from start to finish. And you know anyone who has questions about what the rates are right now, or they might change to this year, they, I'd rather they you know gave me a chat so I can hear about their student and pass on the specific rates. But I do try to keep it very reasonable. Where as a parent, it makes sense to me that per hour that's a very reasonable you know amount of money to to charge. From my perspective, we really want to make this a really exciting and enjoyable experience for families and not some terrible process that is to be dreaded and avoided, you know? And by being educated and organized, you know, you know you're not gonna miss anything, your student's gonna have great options. And I think with Heritage behind you, you know, you know that you're gonna get good guidance into saving and paying for you know, the college experience that works for your family. I think someone did write in a question here. How do I come up with the list of colleges? And, you know, that's based on the interview, an interview with the family, asking them all kinds of questions like, you know, what, how far from home do they want to look? What do they think about fraternity life? cheering for the team, political views, um, all kinds of questions. And then that online tool I use with 130 extra questions. Um, and then looking at their, any financial guidance they've given me and the academic profile of the student. All those things give me breadcrumbs and information that I use to look for colleges, um, you know, that, that meet their needs, looking for some that are those likely, some of the targets and some of the reaches. So that becomes the starting point. I typically put about 20 colleges on the first list, which we whittle down to oh, on the order of 10 by the time we're done. And I try, you know, as a consultant, I try to visit as many colleges as possible. So, 
so that I know what they're like, not just the statistics. Well, I think we're ready to wrap up today's webinar. Eric, thank you again for uh, all of your time and your insights on these topics. If you didn't get a chance to ask a question in the Q&A today, or if you want to dig deeper into any of these topics, uh, please reach out to your Heritage Wealth Management team if you're already a client of Heritage. If you aren't a client, you can reach all of our contact information on our website at heritagefinancial.net. And Eric's email to reach out to him is eric at topchoiceconsulting.com. And it's Eric, E-R-I-C. We also encourage you to follow up with us online. Uh, look at our profile on LinkedIn. We often provide a lot of information on current events and planning topics on LinkedIn and via our blog, which you can also subscribe to by going to our website. So thank you again for listening in on this webinar and staying up to date on some of these topics. Take care.